really quickly, let's go back to just what's possible. Can you explain the notion of vertical farming? Because I don't yeah. think a lot of people realize what that is and the potentiality. So I did an extrapolation in the book regarding vertical farming based on a study out of Columbia University. And what I've calculated crudely, and I did this deliberately to give, show the extremity of it, if you apply vertical farms to the existing agricultural land, just in, in theory, I think it was a 15 story, you would produce enough food for 34 trillion people. Now people say, well, we can't, obviously you have different regional things and, and irrigation and so on, that, but yeah, but it makes moot when you look at that type of number of potential. And the reduction of energy, basically vertical farms allow for a extreme reduction in the need for fertilizer, the need for light and energy, and the need for water. And the, the study, the, the examples of this that exist in different places, granted, you're producing, uh, you're obviously not producing meat. I mean, and, and in truth, human society has to get away from, from animal agriculture anyway, if it expects to be sustainable. And you have an incredible potential for abundance. And you put these in localized areas. You know, in New York, they've been converting some warehouses to start doing this. Very, very small amounts of investment is slowly being put into this, but it needs to be amplified rapidly because with the loss of topsoil, with 70% of our freshwater going to agriculture in the midst of what is effectively a, a water crisis by 20 by 2030 I think it was the stat was 60 percent of the world would be in a water stressed area uh, it, it there's nothing positive in those trends at all so that's one great potential way to not only feed local populations well but also to remove uh, the incredible ecological footprint that agriculture is doing today Automation is also used constantly uh, as a talking point against the rise in labor standards, right? Against wage increases because it will take away these skilled jobs. We saw this in the 80s with, with car manufacturers. We see it today with restaurants, uh, fast food industry, um, stores, right? CVS, et cetera. You encourage automation because you say that it will liberate people. How? Well, it, <clears throat> there's a few levels to it. First, what has been the greatest source of oppression on this planet? since recorded history. Labor. Yeah. So not only do, is, it, is it irresponsible for us not to apply automation because it's more efficient, it's safer, we can create more of an abundance with, more, you know, with less resources, um, it's also a dra dramatic shift in the way human relations has been. So if we can finally remove that ownership, labor, that old classist duality with the use of automation, that would be profound just on that level. I mean, you, if you, you know, people say th silly things too, like, well, if you increase in abundance, uh, we'll have just have overpopulation. People will keep reproducing. It's actually the opposite now. That was the case at the end of the Malthusian trap. We had a huge burst of, pop of, um, huge burst of population when we found, you know, hydrocarbons and then the technology boomed. But when you look at stats now in countries that have overpopulation, they're poor countries. And when you have countries that actually have decent affluency, they, they're not reproducing rapidly anymore. So if you want to stop what people perceive as a apparent overpopulation, which is a dubious word because it's not quantifiably viable, you know, there isn't, there's only overpopulation in our society because our society is so inefficient. It's not overpopulation uh, because you know, suddenly we're at ma outdoing the resources of the planet. Um, but if you create an uh, equitable playing field and you meet people's needs, the population issue will not be an issue. It would completely create it. I can't even emphasize enough what it would do to the psychology of people to be free of that drudgery and that sense of exploitation of each other. How does intellectual property prove to be one of the biggest flaws of this system? I, the main reason is that intellectual property restricts the open flow naturally and it allows, it restricts people's contribution to given ideas. So intellectual property, the whole of industry is pushed by sharing one way or another. So some cell phone company makes something, they invent some kind of proprietary something or another, another cell phone, they release it under, you know, all spice of old secrecy. Then finally another cell phone company experiences that, it imitates it, and suddenly the little competitive war that people call innovation continues. Extremely wasteful and completely unnecessary. So why not just open source all intellectual property across the entire sector, if not across business in general? You would see exponential increase in efficiency. If I could sit back and, and, and design my own camera, along with millions of others in an open source community, a collaborative commons, you would see the efficiency of that given technology far transcend what uh, any given boardroom or any even small group of technicians could ever come up with. That's the wisdom of crowds. And that, that's happening, like that's what drives our industry in the long run but it does it in such a slow way because we're not sharing it directly. So you wanna, you wanna see a dramatic uh, innovation in this world, then drop capitalism, because it's, it's inhibiting innovation more than it is anything else, especially now. 
Yeah, completely inhibiting the medical field as well. Just all these patents oh, on, on medicine, it's disgusting. Well, I mean, think about the, the people that wanted to make generics. I did document this in the book as well. There were people suffering from tuberculosis and HIV-related diseases, and they were looking for, they were looking to make their own generics. And the Western pharmaceutical industry, including all the way up to the White House, said, nope, intellectual property restricts you from producing this. You have to buy it from us. And finally, they gave them like a, you know, a little bit of a discount. <laughs> Only they hundreds of dollars, not thousands, per pill, yeah. per cancer pill. No, the, it, and you bring up a good point. The medical industry and it's, is the best example of artificial scarcity. The idea that these pills cost. You know, I have a family member that had cancer, and they gave her this little thing, and they stuck it on her arm. And it was $17,000 for this little piece of plastic that simply injected the fluid in, into her. $17,000. There's no way. You're paying um, for yachts. Yeah, You're not paying for plastic. This is made by a machine in some pharmaceutical company in about five minutes with chemicals that are being mixed that are far from rare or scarce. It'd be different if they had to go all the way to Amazon and find <laughs> something. And, you know, no, it's, it's the biggest fraud industry out there. I think another fraudulent uh, fundamental basis of, of the whole system is competition because you know we're all ingrained with the notion that all these technological advancements come from competition incentivizing of course the development of these ideas you discuss the need to move from competitive to collaborative yeah. why is competition not all it's made out to be the first problem with competition in a market system where everyone's competing for market share meaning money there the competition becomes the innovation that's produced is artificial it, they're not trying to improve on something to meet a human need. They're trying to improve on something to sell. A healthy uh, uh, industrial system isn't trying to artificially create demand once again. It's there to meet demand. In fact, you don't want to artificially create demand because that means you're going to be reducing your sustainability. You want a minimalistic culture. You don't want what advertising is driving now. So that's an aside of what you're asking, but I think it's a very important point that people miss when they talk about innovation uh, through competition especially. So competition has been proven in many academic journals to be hideously hindering and neur neuroses producing. There's little evidence to say that the competitive industry of, of capitalism actually innovates in a way that's somehow superior to a collaborative system, especially if people have the same intent. So you can imagine, you know, anyone can sit and imagine the building of something, once again, in like an open source collaborative commons, and they know what they want. They can, they can infer what the next stage would be. It doesn't take this sort of imposition built on the comp, comp, competitive coercion, effectively, to impose the demand upon them. So if we know what we want and we can infer the next stage of things, why do we need companies competing against each other? We can just, now we have the technology to work together. And again, it's, it would be that much more innovative if we did that. Yeah, no, but, I mean, when you look at just even your childhood development, I mean, in school, people are incentivized to cheat, yeah. to get ahead. And, and there's always gonna be way more losers. And what does that do to the psychology of, oh, yeah. of humanity? The general competitive neuroses and fetish. It reinforces, once again, the in-group, out-group, underlying uh, hierarchy-enhancing tendency. Because if you have a society that believes in this type of competitive ethic, if you have a society that, that says winners and losers are a part of this system and I want to be a winner, then suddenly you can justify walking over homeless people in the street. You can justify the bombing of this or that country. You can justify just about anything that hurts another human being under the guise that it's just the competitive nature of our world. Our whole system today is based on, on the idea of scarcity, but the opposite, of course, is true. Where we have an overabundance, as, as you're explaining so clearly. Talk about how the development and stages of market capitalism got us to where we are today. There's a, a geographical determinism that isn't talked about enough. When people talk about markets and capitalism, they tend to go back to Adam Smith and say, well, some you know, theorists got together and realized that we should have specialized labor and so on. That's not how it happened at all. You go back to the Gregorian Revolution 10, 12,000 years ago, and once, it, once people decided it was more efficient for themselves to start to settle and create farms and the slight scientific advancement that happened with tools, suddenly you had all the, the prerequisites for things like property and protection labor specialization and trade. And within trade, trade strategizing dominance. And that's the core characteristic in the book. I refer to it as the root socioeconomic orientation of our society, which again is based on that scarcity. And it's also based on competition. And it's based on trade strategizing dominance, which leads to oppression and deprivation and so on as a, as a competitive outcome. So the Neolithic Revolution happened, and suddenly society started to build in these structures with all of those things into it. So 
there hasn't been much of a shift. There have been pockets of people that have lived differently, Aboriginal cultures, Native American cultures. So the geographical determinism has to be taken into account. And you see the force of this dominant kind of desert-based culture and then the, the stratified societies taking hold and slowly eradicating all the other groups trying to live a little bit differently. And suddenly it's manifested as we have today with uh, trade strategizing dominance as the virtue of our, our existence, the need to compete and win, and of course the development of countries, borders, and empires. Empires, if it wasn't the United States, in this type of climate it would have been someone else because it's simply the most efficient state for any group dominance to maintain as much total global dominance as they can. You have to break it, and the only way to break it is to start with root changes in what started all of this, which is effectively the economic perception, your perception of your, the perception of your survival in your group. And you, if you change that, then you'll be able to slowly morph society back into what was really a pre-Neolithic kind of worldview, which was all based on community, gift giving. Uh, if you look, 99% of human society existed without money and markets. A lot of people forget that too. So this isn't some inevitability the way we live. What is the silver bullet that can possibly transform this negative trajectory that we're on? And that is structural change of the economy. Morality is not going to do it. Our free will is not going to do it. Our rational sense is not going to do it in and of itself because we are so inhibited and dominated by the structural psychology generated from our social system. And reforms aren't going to do it either, which is one of the main points of your book, is that 21st century activism has been far too localized. Yeah. I, I, I don't like to be one to criticize all the well-meaning people in the activist community, but I think it's a constructive conversation to say, if we don't, if we don't focus on the root and we keep sparsely drawing attention in this or that protest or this or that activist initiative to certain pockets of effectively problems, it just ends up running in place. The activist initiatives that are required now have to grasp that and realize that now it's time for galvanization towards removing the foundation of our social system and hence the market. We have to really start to move, move away from market economics as rapidly as we possibly can to save our ecology and to save the stability of our society in terms of group relationships. The antagonism that's created with our class system builds into all the other antagonisms we see, whether it's, whether it's gender, whether it's race, whether it's nationalistic. So it, it's like that central kernel that keeps amplifying the worst of our group, our anti-group uh, associations. All of the major social activist communities that reached really high thresholds of acceptance or at least had an effect clearly pointed out the flaws of our social system. And funny how you don't really read about that in American academic books. I didn't. It's interesting how these key figures are completely whitewashed in terms of their anti-capitalist bent, right? Uh, everyone from Malcolm X to Martin Luther King to Frida Kahlo. How do we socialize and localize the enterprise, and who is standing in the way of this being done? You know, obviously, the, the forefront of it are, the, are the, the ownership class, as it's been historically called. The power structure is defined by the ownership class. And going back to the state, the state has always been comprised of the heavy business interests of any given society, heavy economic interests, even before business was a thing, so to speak. And who, who do, what, what incentive do they have to want to alter their position? That's why it's going to take a galvanized force of activists that is, the world probably has never seen in order to overcome this hurdle. And I, I'm, I'm not you know, promoting any kind of violence or anything, but there has to be something that stops, stops this thing in its tracks uh, before the ecological. The ecological crisis, if it is allowed to materialize in the way the trajectories show, between climate change, between uh, the water scarcity, between all the other levels of pollution that, that are coming to fruition, the incredible amount of waste, you know, more plastic in the ocean by 2050, more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050. Good God. Uh, the general destruction of the oceans you know, overall because of various factors that are happening. Um, if this is allowed to materialize, and this is why I argue at the end of the book, it will just create that much more class antagonism and make it that much more difficult for us to pull out of, of this horrible uh, in-group, out-group phenomenon and the oppression that we see. So there's a time limit ticking down because if things start getting literally scarce, remember the first, first and second world war were dominance wars. They weren't based on scarcity. The kind of wars in the future, if scarcity hits like it, it's going to, if we don't change, is they're going to be cataclysmic. The, we, the human society hasn't seen that yet, hasn't seen an actual resource war, not a real one.
not when water is now limited and people are going to go to war over it. And it's ridiculous to even think that that would happen, frankly, because we have all the technology to resolve it. But the arrogance of the people that are in power and the, the myopic view of the business community is such that, again, they blinker these things out in favor of the general structure and they're willing to forego the well-being of others uh, in euphemistically uh, in order uh, to preserve their positions. So no more respect needs to be placed on the billionaires of this world or the political establishment. I'm not saying that people should be just arbitrarily ridiculed, but we have to break the cultural violence this need, this incessant impulsive thing that's happened in society where we worship class and status and billionaires. And it hasn't gotten better. <laughs> it has, it's gotten much worse, as again, I think the Trump, sig Trump, Trump selection signifies. And we can't, we should loathe people. Anyone that's a billionaire that doesn't say, I'm sorry, I'm a billionaire, but I'm gonna do my best, that's someone you would respect. Anyone that doesn't question the fact that, that doesn't raise the issue that it's wrong for it even to be possible that a billionaire can exist in this planet, it's just as it's wrong that someone should be sleeping on the street in their life. If that isn't pointed out, then the, neur the neuroses uh, will continue. It certainly is not gonna last, and, and your book is incredible. Again, everyone check it out, The New Human Rights Movement. The end vision for this book is a beautifully democratized symbiotic ecosystem almost, where people are collaboratively growing society. Yeah. Talk about how, how you lay that vision out. Well, in terms of transition, there are five steps. So I try to be as, as direct as I can because it's very easy to just bring up theory. So the five steps are the application of automation that we've talked about, the access of things as opposed to property, which doesn't necessarily mean that suddenly no property exists. It means that the society is incentivized to share what it has, especially things of higher complexity, like cars. We see these trends happening already with uh, automated ride sharing systems. You, know, you can imagine how much less pollution there would be if all cars were automated and then shared and no one owned a car. The, the less congestion, less parking. Uh, obviously, that's not good for industry because in this type of society, once again, the idea is for everyone to own one of everything and repeatedly buy things. So that's antagonistic to that. Then there's open source, which builds into the access phenomenon. Open source is what will create the innovation. Then there's the localization phenomenon. That's, that's where we finally realize we keep a global sense, but we realize we don't need to have all of this industry spread all over the world in order to satisfy a community on the other side of the world. You know what I mean? So that's that one. And then the other one is this more difficult thing to bring up called digitized network feedback, which all that really means, especially the, today we have something called the Internet of Things. And it's a kind of a it's kind of a silly phenomenon at this stage where people are connecting their toasters and refrigerators to the internet and they get updates and it does weird things and it's not really uh, focused. But with this technology where you can have Wi-Fi clicked on and say the entire city of Los Angeles, which is possible, you could have free Wi-Fi across the entire city if people wanted to do it, you track all the transactions that are happening, economic transactions, and it can be within a monetary system or without, and you have all the feedback that you need to know what's happening in an industry. And you can apply that to global society simultaneously. It's not a sci-fi fantasy. What it means is that you have the information, the preferences, all the things that the anti-socialist people brought up years ago and said, oh, we could never have a society that isn't based on trade because we can't understand people's preferences and supply and demand. We need the feedback of money. So that's completely debunked now as well. So you put all these together and you end up with a system that incentivizes people working together, incentivizes people sharing, all those kindergarten things that we're taught, remember? All those things that we're supposed to have in our values that are completely robbed of us uh, as we grow older and we realize that all the things we were taught as children is that our ideal values were apparently wrong because no one ascribed to them anymore. And you have a non-competitive society, obviously, and you have a society that's actually sustainability focused because we're understanding what we're doing. So the, it creates peaceful coexistence, more peaceful coexistence, and peaceful coexistence with nature, meaning we're not over-exploiting. And there are other measures I could talk about too. When you actually have an intelligent economy, when you actually are recognizing what you're doing, you start to see the natural limits. And if you're really efficient, and this is the, this is the thing that people bring up, if you're really efficient based on what we understand, there won't be heavy natural limits anymore, like we assume today. So there won't be a circumstance based on current statistics where poverty needs to exist. And the only caveat to that, and I want to bring this back up because this isn't a totally deterministic, mechanistic, mechanistic view, is that we have to have a mature culture that doesn't thrive on this over-consuming, materialistic, vain uh, uh, idealism.
that is the great, uh, that's the great argument I hear from people because they're so brainwashed into this view. I envision an abundance where I don't own anything. I envision a world where I live and I have what I need at access, very little to maintain, a new kind of nomadic culture where people can travel the world. They're not bound into, with driving at rush hour to some job in a building pushing paper around for no reason, driving back in rush hour, increasing their stress and reducing their lifespan. And the very idea that you have people piling into city centers at the same period of time every day still that, that, that should be mind-numbing. That's, that's insane that we're still even doing it. Look at the traffic in Los Angeles just for that reason. That's an aside. But, you know, this, I envision a world where people are actually able to, to get what they need and it becomes a social reality as opposed to a material and vindictive and status-based reality. It doesn't mean that hierarchy doesn't exist in the future or in an idealized society because there are other things that we do. I'm not a visual artist. You're a visual artist. I'm a musician. There are natural hierarchies that happen and we respect those hierarchies because we appreciate the talents of people not because they're, they have more money than you, therefore you're supposed to glamorize them and look up to them as though they're better than you. That is a complete contrivance. So there's always going to be a natural hierarchy, which is good, because that proves our group mind, it proves our collaborative sense that you can do things that I can't do, and so on and so forth. That's what motivates the collaborative sense and the power of our society as a civilization. And if we can bring those form, that formula together, we could get everything back on track.